Welcome to the Wayne Public Library's virtual author chat. My guest today is Kristen Houghton. Kristen is the author of the best-selling series, A Kate Harlow Private Investigation, which has been named Best Series of 2023 and 2024 by WNYC Book Clubs. Her most recent book, Teeth, The Haunting of Dansbury Plot, a YA novel, has been on the Book Club's New York City bestsellers list for eight weeks. Kristen's writing portfolio includes The Huffington Post, Thrive, Bella, interviews and reviews for HBO documentaries, The Style Network, and OWN, the Oprah Winfrey Network. She is in demand as a speaker for social organizations, book clubs, universities, writing seminars, and corporate events. Kristen holds dual doctorates in the fields of education and world languages, and is a member of the Mystery Writers of America, Kappa Delta Pi, and Treasure, Treasure Emerita of Project Literacy. Her books are published by Skylight NYC Publishing Publishers. Welcome, Kristen. Please tell us a little more about yourself and your novel, Teeth, The Haunting of Dansbury Plot. Well, as we were saying before, um, why teeth in capital letters? Uh, it's about, um, it's a coming of age story, really, about boys who grow up in a town where there's this plot of land where nothing grows. Nobody will walk on it. Uh, people are afraid to even pass by it. Got, kids gone the way to school, they'll walk on the other side. And there's a ball field across the street from Dansbury Plot. If you hit a ball and it goes on the plot, you automatically know that you're not going to go and get it. You just get another one out of your, your gym bag or whatever, and you continue the game. Um, it's a haunted area. And these boys who have just started their summer vacation are out to solve the mystery with the help of the, one of the boys' grandfathers, who's a history professor at a local college. And you, you, you find the kids they're just so much fun. They were fun for me to write because they're typical kids. They're looking at summer vacation, they're biking, they're, they want to go swimming, and then they're also trying to solve this mystery, and they do a very good job of it. Okay. Many young adult novels explore themes of identity and belonging. How do these themes resonate in your novel, Teeth, The Haunting of Dansbury Plot? I think, um, the boys are finding out about themselves. They, uh, they're they noticing girls. They're 11 years old. They're not interested in girls, but they're noticing the older sister of a bully in their class. He's uh, got a beautiful 16-year-old sister, and they all think, oh, she's very pretty, and they think about that. They're thinking about going swimming. They're thinking about going to a Batman movie. They want to see that, um, and they're just typical kids, so I think Kids, people who read these young adults, 11, 12, I even had somebody who was in her 20s, she thought it was great, who read the book. You kind of see yourself in this, the typical kid, but you know what? There's also something else going on in town that we have to be interested in and see if we can take care of it. Okay. And how do you balance entertainment value with addressing more serious or challenging topics in your writing? I found as a reader that if uh, I'm reading something serious and the author every once in a while injects humor, it makes it so much more readable to me. So that's what I try to do with my books. Um, in this particular book, there's Kevin and Chris. Chris is the serious one. He's the one who loves words. Any word, he has a book where he writes down words that he loves to hear and he'll repeat them over and over again. And then there's Kevin, Kev, his friend, who's interested in Batman and somehow thinks Batman is real and can help them solve this mystery. He also has a pet white rat that he found named Louie Louie because his father is always singing the song. So there's a humor with uh, on Kev's part. And in the seriousness, Kev kind of gives you a little break so you can kind of laugh at what he says and does. Okay. And um, for the the two young adult characters or any of the other characters in the book, do you draw inspiration from real people or events when creating your characters, when creating those characters or any of the characters in the story? Yeah, and someone said to me, why did you write about boys and not girls? I really don't know, I'll be honest with you, except I thought they might be very curious about different things. Um, not that girls aren't. I mean, I'm definitely one of those girls who was always curious about everything. But I just thought it would be interesting to write about boys and how they work through their own lives and, and what they want to do. Um, and I I just, uh, well, give, give me that question again. <laughs> <laughs> Did you draw inspiration from any real people or events? I think um, kids that I knew when I was growing up, 
Um, there, were, there was one boy who was kind of like Kev, who always dropped the G's on his word. Instead of saying something, he would say thump something, you know, kind of cute kid. And uh, the event, yes, there was an empty lot near my grandparents' house. I always remember this. And when I would go to visit my grandparents, I would never go near this lot. If it was daytime, I'd cross the street and walk up. Like I had to walk up a hill just not to go near the lot. At night, I would go blocks out of my way not to pass this place. It was that spooky. So I thought, okay, this sounds like Dansbury Plot. It's a spooky area. Let me draw my inspiration from that. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That makes sense. It's and still I, there, I just, by the way. The empty oh, lot is still there. Wow. That's, ama that's amazing it, that, that <laughs> nothing was built on it. because that Nothing. nothing. Wow. That, that, you need, that's you, not the norm. The yeah, I'd just love to know who's paying the taxes on that plot of land. But anyway. <laughs> exactly. Um, so um, what do you think sets young adult literature apart from other genres? And why do you enjoy writing for that audience? I enjoy writing for it because I think kids need something that speaks to them, but doesn't dismiss their problems or their ideas. Like there are no quick fixes and kids know that too. They know if they have a problem, there's not a quick fix. They don't want to be talked down to either. If they have a fear or they have something that's bothering them, they'd like to come up with a solution and don't, you know, say, oh, it's nothing. Oh, don't worry about it. And writing that for young people, I see myself in it, too, because I remember as a child, I just wanted to be understood. I was, um, you know, one of these kids who was very into my brain, you know, uh, always imagining things. And I could make up the best stories. One of my teachers said to me, she goes, you're not a liar, but you just like to make up good stories. <laughs> so I think that was really it. And I think uh, that's what, what children want. They want somebody who's going to understand them. And they see this in my writing with these characters. Okay. Um, and what do you hope your readers feel or experience when they read your novels? I hope that they experience what's happening in the moment, like when they finally discover the secret of Dansbury plot. Like, did they see this coming? Did they have any hints in the book? I did give some hints along the way, but there were also red herrings that led you in another direction. And I want them to actually see in their mind's eye what's going on and try to be there themselves you know like oh I, this sounds like something i could be there i could be with chris and kev and find out about dansbury plot okay um so you do have a um you do write for adults also and you have yes. the Kate harlow private investigation series um i'm gonna throw a different question that's not that one <laughs> I didn't that's okay that of time. um well can you tell us about that series um I wanted to write about a strong woman and I wanted to write about a woman who was a real person. You know, a lot of times when you're reading about someone, they're perfect. Kate is not perfect. Kate likes to eat. That's one thing. And I remember one time at a book signing, this woman came up to me. She says, I love Kate. And I said, well, oh, thank you so much. She goes, do you know why? I said, no, she goes, because she eats. And it's true. She's a private investigator. You know, she's in the office. She needs to like have something to eat. She'll order a pizza which is something I would do. Um, so I wanted a very strong woman. She doesn't take any garbage from anybody. Um, she will fight back and she, she doesn't mind bending the law if it will help her clients. And that's kind of something that I thought, you know, somebody who really wants to help people will do. She doesn't do anything outright illegal, but she kind of bends it a little bit if she thinks it's going to benefit her clients. Okay. And um, how many books are in the series so far? In the series, there's six books. There's another one coming. The, the, the other one's coming after I finish the sequel to Dansbury's Plot. <laughs> okay. Um, so there will be a sequel to Dansbury's Plot. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good, good to know. Um, can you share any personal experiences or anecdotes that influenced your writing? Um. I think one of the things is uh, a personal experience, obviously, would be that that uh, empty lot by my grandparents. But also, I love to just tell stories. And I remember saying, I'm a storyteller. I'm not just a writer. I'm a storyteller. And that kind of goes back generations. And the people like, let's see, uh, like with the Vikings, 
they would love to have the bard, the person who told the stories was very important during those long, cold winters, there was nothing to do. And if you had a good storyteller, you were really fortunate. So I think that's one of the things I've always loved that people can who could tell stories and make it interesting. And that had a big influence on me. Okay. And um, so in terms of your your writing process, um, what can you describe your writing process from the idea to the finished product? Yeah, sometimes those ideas come in the middle of the night, but, <laughs> and I'll have to get up and write it down really fast. Um, I had the idea in my mind of the story, the actual from beginning to end. I know exactly how I think I want it to end. And I'll start that way. I'll start from the beginning and I'll keep going. And then sometimes I'll write the ending. I could have written maybe one chapter and all of a sudden I'm writing the ending just so it's there. I know it's there. I have to get there and I can change it. I can make changes at the end of the story. I can change that ending completely if I want to, but at least I know it's there. So for me, it's a straight line. I know a lot of people say they do an arc, but I do my straight line. I have to do that uh, right from the beginning to the end. And do you, do you, do you plot it out from, you know, like um, do a fleshed out outline or is it more like seat of your pants kind of? Kind of a combination of both, but I do flesh out the characters. Like what do they look like? What do they want? What's in their background um, that makes them the way they are? In one of the Kate Harlow books, there was um, an assassin and he turned out to be an assassin with a heart, but there was something that made him have that heart. So I had to put that into the background. And then I thought, all right, you know what? I'm going to put that in the book too. So people know he's really got something good about him. He's not all bad. You know, he could kill just not even thinking about it, but he also is not all bad. He has a heart. Okay. Um, and are there any craft elements that you think I'm really good at and others that you're like, really need to improve here. <laughs> um, I think I'm very good at being concise. When I first started writing, I would, to explain something, I'd take three or four paragraphs. Now I can do it in, let's say, one and a half paragraphs, or even one paragraph. So I'm more concise, and more explicit. Uh, as far as what would I like to have more of, I would like to love editing because that's such a horror sometimes. <laughs> But um, I think I would be, I, it would do me well to be a little more circumspect with my editing. And now I kind of put it off, you know, okay, I'll edit tomorrow. I'll edit the next day. Oh, oh, look, there's a butterfly. I have to follow the butterfly. And then I'll do my editing, that type of thing. But that, yeah, I'd like to, to do more with my editing. But I think I'm much more concise and, um, and a better writer for that, having that. Okay. Um, how do you approach character development? Do your characters ever surprise you as you're writing? Yes. Um, I was very surprised at one of the characters I was writing. She was a lady of the evening and a uh, high priced, of course, uh, lady of the evening and Kate Harlow's best friend. And I kind of set, set her in New Orleans. They live in New York now, but she was originally from New Orleans. And I gave her a background, which I didn't even think of doing where there was a voodoo background within her family. I mean, it didn't, you know, feature into much of the stories, but just that, that she had that mystical uh, attitude about herself, that surprised me. I didn't expect that to happen to the character. And then sometimes my characters surprise me because they take on a life of their own. It's almost like they're speaking to me in my head. I sound crazy, but, <laughs> but sometimes they are. They're speaking to you in your head and they're saying, this is how it's going to be. This is what I want to do. This is how I want you to write me. So yeah, they, they sometimes take on a life of their own. Okay. Um, over the years, how have you developed as a writer, would you say? I think as a writer, I've become more um, disciplined. I will do, I, I set time for when I have to write. Nothing is going to disturb that time. Um, before that, I would write on the fly, and I was a teacher, so sometimes during my prep periods, I would write, um, you know, if I had the time, but uh, since, you know, I, I went into writing full-time, now I set specific times for writing. I also say to myself, though, you need a break. If you need a break, go get a cup of coffee, go for a walk, 
take a breath, you know, but I'm, I'm much more disciplined as a writer, I think. And I think that has helped me a lot. Okay. Um, so in terms of your publishing journey, um, Lure the Kate Harlow Mysteries, was that your first book that you had published, the first one in that series? Or was there published other things published before that? Actually, the first book I had was, and then I'll be happy, stop sabotaging your happiness and live your life for yourself. <laughs> okay. And it was a, a series of 10 stories of women who pretty much did not live their own lives. They lived for their husbands. They lived for their children. They lived for their jobs, but never really living for themselves. And these are true stories. So I interviewed people. Of course, I changed names. Um, but I interviewed them and then I just put it in a book and that was my very first book that got published. It was nonfiction, but it was my first one. And what was your first fiction book to be published? My first fiction book was Kate Harlow for I Have Sinned. And it was um, about pedophilia in the Catholic church. And I remember I wrote it and my editor called me up and said, you know, we got a phone call from Bill Dermody of the New York Archdiocese. And I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, he really doesn't want this book to be published. And I said, why? He said, because it's about the church and pedophilia and the, the scandals and everything. And I said to him, well, it's in the news. It's, I didn't make it up. I'm not lying about this. And so he went to Bill Dermody, called him on the phone and he said, look, he goes, you know, it's in the news. She can definitely write this. And Dermody said, oh, this is terrible and all this other stuff. And you're going against the Catholic Church and my editor. I got to love him. I really do. He goes, I don't care. I'm Jewish. So it doesn't <laughs> matter to me. So I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> but the book got published. And it got great reviews. So I was happy about that. That was my first Kate Harlow book. Okay. And um, who published? Who published the book? The, it originally was published by Kohler Publishing. And then I bought back the rights because I wasn't happy with the way they were, you know, uh, doing the publicity and everything. And then it was republished by Skylight NYC. Okay. Um, what role do um, beta readers or editors play in your writing process? I don't really use beta readers. I, I find sometimes they're too critical or they just aren't on the same page that I am on. So I really depend on my editors. They're very good. We have back and forth. Sometimes we have arguments about, you know, should you put this in the book? I don't know if I like that part of the plot, but we go back and forth and we make sure that we get the details right and that we get out a really good finished product, one that I'm satisfied with and one that they're satisfied with. Okay. Um, and how do you get your editors um, through, this, through Skylight Publishing? Yeah, it's a it's kind of a funny story. Um, I was writing for Huffington Post and somebody asked me if I would do a review on a book they wrote for, for SAT study. I said, sure, you know, so I did it and she loved it. She said, this is great. I'm so happy you wrote this. You know, I'm going to print it out and uh, send out copies to schools and everything. If there's anything I could ever do for you, let me know. And I jokingly said to her, find me an agent. And she did. <laughs> so she, the agent um, that she had was when she, the person that she went to uh, college with and she gave her to me and she was great. Stacy Glick, absolutely wonderful person. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but you never know, you know, you do Just a good deed and yes. you never know, do a good deed and see what happens. <laughs> oh. Um, so, <laughs> We're going to go to the editing. How do you stay motivated and committed to a project, especially during the revision and editing stages? Oh. <laughs> I think every author will tell you they hate editing. You've got the finished. No, they no, love editing. You'd be no. surprised at how many I ask this question to, and they're like, I love the editing. I'm like, oh. no, I don't understand that. <laughs> I mean, you're going through it sometimes five times. You're going through an entire book, rereading every single thing. Um, so for, for me to stay motivated, I have to take frequent breaks. I actually, after I end a book, I take a week off. Um, I'm, I'm not like John Grisham. After he ends a book, he takes six months off. I take a week off and just refresh my mind, like do nothing important. 
nothing, you know, time consuming or anything. And then I get back to it and I have to make sure that I say to myself, all right, it's nine o'clock in the morning, you're going to be doing this until one o'clock in the afternoon. And I make sure that I do it. So it's a back and forth again with the editors and all, but usually, you know, the finished product is something I'm very satisfied with. Always, I have to say, the finished product is something I'm satisfied with. But the editing itself, you are rereading every single word you wrote. <laughs> you have uh -huh. to make sure that you want it there. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, I agree with you. I have never understood everyone who tells me <laughs> these authors. I'm like, really? I It takes a special kind of person <laughs> to want to reread their stuff <laughs> over and over and make the changes that, you know, don't always yeah. come easy. <laughs> um, so how important was it for you to join a writer's group? Or if you have critique partners, how important are they? Um, the writer's groups that I belong to, we're mostly interested in, like we will form, um, book, uh, we'll go to book clubs. We, uh, we will uh, do book signings. We'll do book readings. I had one at the Strand in New York with a group of authors. That's the type of groups that I belong to. Um, I found, I, I don't know, some authors say, oh, I love it when people critique my work. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I don't mind. My editor will tell me, oh, please get that paragraph out of there. I hate it or something, you know. Um, and then we have back and forth. But I don't, I think some people, when they critique, I think sometimes they're just being petty. I, I've found this with other authors because I have a friend who's a very good author and she had been in one of the groups and she said to me, she was she was demoralized by what they were saying about her book. And I said, you know what, get out of the group. They're not helping you and just come, you know, and, and see what your editor says and what your editor is doing. And she goes, well... I don't know, maybe these people know more than my editor. I says, nobody knows more than your editor. Your editor is a professional. So make sure you just go with your editor. So that's what I've always done. I go with the editors. There, others are kind of competition, you know, yeah, right, they're yes. all trying to be published or yes. to publish your next book. Well, see, you hit something on the head there. You're absolutely right that they're vying to be published. So sometimes they're going to be very critical of your work and not because your work needs to be criticized but because they're a little bit jealous i've have seen that with some authors it takes a i mean i know that there are some people who have had critique partners the same critique partners for decades yeah and it's just a perfect blend and it worked for them and they are fortunate but others you know it's hard it's yeah. hard to to get into that where you're you're kind of both rooting for each other and you're not just competing against each other it's a, I was at a, a book signing last year and we, there was three authors and we got along very well, but then there was a fourth author and she just was not nice to us. <laughs> she was a little bit jealous and she let it be known. And we were, you know, we were trying to be really friendly and just have a nice group. And she made it unpleasant so that one of the women who was there, she said to me, if she's at another book thing, I'm not going. And I said, no, no, you come. Um, you know, just kind of ignore it. What are you going to do? This this is just how she is. So, yeah, that happens. <laughs> um, so what advice would you give a new writer that's just starting out? I would tell a new writer to write what they want to write. You know, there's that old adage that says, write what you know. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily believe that because I'm not an 11 year old boy. But yet I was able to kind of channel them and write about them. And I'm not a private investigator either. I know zilch about that. I learned a lot through my research. But um, I think you have to write what gets you. If you, you're interested in something, write about it. Don't write what people tell you to write. Sometimes you get good ideas if somebody tells you to. Like with the second book uh, for Dansbury Plot, I was going to make Dansbury Plot a standalone. And a friend of mine says, oh, no, you should make it a series. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I, I think standalone is better. And she's like, no, no, no. You can have hauntings every place else, too. So I'm like, okay, you're right. I'll do that. <laughs> but they have to write about what they want to write about. Okay. Um, and I like to end um, the, the chat on uh, asking a final question, which tends to be a little off topic. So okay. <laughs> um, you, what can you tell us about your life and other adventures column on Substack? 
I love Substack. Um, I was introduced to it by uh, someone who I was writing for a magazine called Skirt. Because they have, I say skirt because they have an exclamation point at the end of the word. But I was writing for them and they went out of business. And um, she said, oh, you know, you should try Substack. So I did. I was very happy with them because they're very much like the old Huffington Post. Really love that. And um, it's life and other adventures. It's really going through life the way you want it to be. And it, it, it touches on sadness. It touches on happiness. It touches on uh, marriages, families, your profession, whatever you want to do to make your life good. Those are all adventures in life. So we have life, we're living, but we also have other adventures. And um, we're also uh, doing a little bit on politics now um, on Substack. So I thought that was a good thing too. And I said to my husband, because I had written about uh, politics way back in Huffington Post, and I had gotten some really nasty comments from people that they really had to, you know, they, they had to delete them from my page. I have gotten nothing but good comments this time around. So I'm very happy about that. Um, but it's like, it's life. It's everything that you want to live. We always feel sometimes, I, I have to, I, I do have to say this too. It, it's, we're women and men mean it too, but we're women and we're not just homemakers. We're not just mothers. We're not just... We have so much more that we have never really tapped into. I'll give you an example. My mother studied at Douglas College, which was the college at Rutgers only for women. You couldn't attend Rutgers. You had to attend Douglas because it was only women. She studied to be an accountant. Didn't become an accountant until she was in her late 50s because they would never hire a woman to be an accountant. You can be a secretary. You could be a bookkeeper, but you could not be an accountant. And that's what my mother wanted to be. And she wasn't allowed to do that. So it's a kind of a journey to, you know, going backwards. What was life like and what is it like now? And how do we want to make it even better? And what's your journey? So that's what Life and Other Adventures really is about, our journey through life, men and women. Do you pick your topics for that or are you given a topic or? No, we have to pick our own topic. Sometimes they'll give you something if they think it's important and they want you to write about it and then you do that. But most of the time they just tell you to pick your own topic and make it, make it current, make it current. Okay. Don't, you know, delve into like 1890. <laughs> Unless it's, you know, you know, flows into this narrative. That yes. It can appear. Um, <laughs> Okay. Um, and so when will um, the sequel to Teeth be out? Are you working it will, on it? it? Yes, it will be out in summer of 2025. Okay. Same that's what they're telling me. Oh, <laughs> same characters or new characters? The same two boys, uh, but with new characters. We're also bringing back the grandfather for a short period of time in the book. But it's another place. It actually takes place down the Jersey Shore. And um, there is, again, you know, are we seeing these things, but there is a swamp near Cape May um, that's kind of creepy looking. I mean, people do go into it. You know, there's ducks and everything in there. But to me, I thought it was a little creepy. So, yeah, it's taking place there at the Jersey Shore. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Kristen, for being with us this afternoon. And um, wish you all the best of luck with the... Um, with your mystery series and also with their sequel to um, Teeth. Looking forward to it next summer. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I had a lot of fun. <laughs>